Okay, uh, so one of the things I'm skipping around with here, I wanted to kind of put together, I, I did skip this in the previous one because I wanted to put these together. Uh, one is cognitive dissonance. This is very important to sort of pay attention to because it is something we're kind of taught to do and everyone kind of does in some level. Cognitive dissonance is a psychological tension between created by two simultaneous conflicting cognitions, ideas, beliefs, opinions. The term was introduced by American psychologist Leon Festinger in a theory of cognitive dissonance in 1957. Festinger observed that the conflict creates psychological discomfort, which motivates the person affected to try to resolve it by reestablishing consonance among his or her cognitions. This can be accomplished either by abandoning or modifying a previously held notion or mode of behavior by adding other supportive cognitions to bolster one view and overwhelm the other, or simply by evading the conflict through denial and rationalization. The experience of dissonance is a subjective matter depending on whether two cognitions are logically inconsistent but on the individual's perception that they are. Although not universally accepted, the theory has proved an influential approach to the understanding of attitude formation and change. The classic example of cognitive dissonance was provided in a study by Festinger and two colleagues. This is when Prophecy Fails, 1956, of a group of re re religious Adventists who were convinced the world would end on a certain date. When the appointed date came and went, the believers were forced to deal with the clash between the expectation and reality, either by forsaking their conviction or by somehow explaining the discrepancy. In this case, the group's leader announced that the world had been saved by their faith. So it's you, you kind of have two ideas kind of going on at once here. And I have I think I have another um, idea with this. And this should be up, but it looks like my phone crashed. Hooray! Just when I wanted to have a thing. Oh, those are different. That's not it. Is this it? Here we go. Uh, people convince themselves of truth because of cognitive sense when a verified piece of information threatens someone's worldview or self-concept. An uncomfortable tension occur occurs from having two conflicting thoughts, and the brain works to avoid discomfort by resolving the conflict. Because the actual facts cannot be changed, one either has to change their own mind or continue to accept the false truths through reinterpretation and irrational behavior, and the latter is typically much easier to do. So, hey, you know, your behavior is uh, causing you problems in your life. <laughs> for example, like um, blanking on an exact example right now, but oh, hey, I'm, I'm going out and I'm doing stuff and, and I'm having, you know, it's causing problems, you know, at school maybe. Yeah, you know, my, maybe I'm working two jobs and going to school. Not like I had any practice in that whatsoever. I'm thinking everything's fine. Like I got, I got, I got stuff sorted. Okay, I'm, you know, maybe I'm not hanging out with my friends. Maybe I don't have a significant other, but you know I'm working, and and I'm going to school. I'm getting it done, um, and I think everything's going great. But I'm getting in trouble at work because my work's sloppy, and my grades are falling in school. But I still think everything's cool. It's like well, the reality is showing it's not, but I'm still thinking it is. And at some point in time, I have maybe I have to rationalize that. Well, I got a bad. I'm getting bad bad grade in this class because it's college. And all we have is two papers and two tests, and that's all our grades, you know. And and I did kind of mess up the the midterm, so that's messing up my grade in that. That's really what's going. On. And the thing at work, it was, you know, man, it was, you know, you know, Greg over there just was 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 messed stuff up, and it didn't get so I couldn't get my stuff in. Or it's really, you know, you, you have to reevaluate your life at this point in time. It's like okay. How are you going to manage this a little bit better? So that's kind of, it's not quite a super great example, but that idea. There's these two things that are going on, and, you know, you're convincing yourself both are correct when both aren't. Cognitive psychology 
is the approach to psychology that stresses the importance of cognition to human development and behavior. Cognition is from the Latin for to know or to think, refers to the process by which the mind acquires, represents, and uses knowledge, accompanying sensation, perception, reasoning, learning, language comprehension and production, problem solving, and memory. So cognition is 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 all your brainy stuff. So everything you take in, everything you think about what you take in, the opinions of it, uh, how you learn, what you choose to learn, because you can be in a class, you know, in, in school, high school or college or whatever, you're still going to choose to learn what you kind of choose to learn, including behavior and everything else like that. Um, learning um, how you how you deal with issues and stuff like that, all that is sort of encompassed in there. The cognitive perspective stands in at least partial contrast to schools of thought emphasizing the effect, the affective, a f f e c t i v e, or emotional, uh, social cultural, physiological, and behavioral explanations of human thought and behavior. So, in other words, the 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 idea is that it doesn't take into account a certain amount of emotions, uh, your environment socially terms of, of the people around you and, and where you were born and, and what you choose to do, who you choose to be around. Physiological, actually talking about how the brain is. So, you know, the idea of, oh, you know, some sort of traumatic brain injury would have then now, now changed uh, how, you know, you view your development and your behavior. Um, and then behavior, you know, having explaining things psychologically just based on behavior. So instead of kind of using all these things together, these schools separate it out. So your your cognitive abilities, your emotions, your, the epigenetics, your behavioral, the actual physical part of your brain. So instead of all these things, people looking at all these things together, they look at them separately and then argue about it. It's basically the rundown for that. <coughs> cognitive approach was prefigured by the researches of early Gestalt theorists and developed by the Swiss psychologist Jean Piaget in the studies of child development. In the 1930s, the American behavioralist Edward Chase Tolman proposed that learning occurs through the formation of a cognitive map and learned relationships between experience and expectations. The development of cognitive psychology was catalyzed in the 1950s by the revolution in linguistics and by the growth of cybernetics, both of which encouraged the twin metaphor of mind as computer and computer as mind. The view of cognitive operations as informational processing analogous to the workings of electronic computer. Cognitive psychotherapies work on the assumption that emotions and behavior arise from cognitive processes and that dysfunctions stem from an erroneous view of the world and one's relations to it. It's almost like faulty information got put into the system. By identifying these unrealistic thought patterns, the individual can begin to change them. Cognitive methods are often, especially in short-term therapy, used in combination with behavioral techniques such as rewards and punishments, desensitization through flooding, intentional exposure to uncomfortable thoughts and the objects of phobias in order to overcome them, and behavioral contracts between client and therapy to unlearn ingrained responses, so it's behavioral modification. The, interdis the interdisciplinary aspect of cognitive studies has grown since the 1970s, developing into what is now called cognitive science, an inquiry into the nature of thought, reasoning, belief, and knowledge that encompasses linguistics, computer science, neuroscience, and philosophy, as well as psychology. Another new interdisciplinary field, cognitive ethology, has begun to pro provide evidence for the long ridiculed position that animals can think. So there has been some growth, according to this, that uh, 
people are starting to be like, oh, well, it's not just this or just that or just this. We've got to kind of work together in all these different things because, you know, as human beings, we're fairly complicated in, in a lot of ways. So all these different things come into aspects. So not only the way you learn and what you choose to learn and the way you think, um, but also how your behavior then influences yourself how you know your brain might actually physically be there could be uh, sort of things and there could be some chemical imbalance different mood and behavioral changes can also be linked to different things in other parts of the body like the thyroid going because for some reason the thyroid is super hyper massively disproportionately important to a lot of things i don't i, I don't get it uh but um so a lot of things all working together with there we go I'll just start from there next time um, with that as well so you, you have the idea also and some of my other students are going to be are going to be used to this here you've got the thought cycle so are you new no you might be done are you done no mess that up so the first thing you have is you know you, you get the the outside reaction from people it's not the first I'm kind of going backwards of this so the first thing you kind of get is the outside reaction of people right and the outside reaction of people is like well I don't like the way you know so and so is talking about me I don't like the way this teacher is looking at me funny or, or talking to me like I'm some sort of some sort of thing with that well why are they doing that by and large you know, there, yeah, yeah, there are going to be there are going to be some teachers in this example. Yeah, there might be some of them that might be just being a butt about some things. By and large, though, you know, especially if you keep getting the same reactions over time by many people. My mom actually said this. You know, if one person, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, if one person is telling you something about yourself that they don't like or your behavior, it could be maybe them. If you have several people telling you pretty much the same thing, it's no longer them. The world is not conspiring out to you. It's now you. You are the one that then has to be able to look at your behaviors, which is the next, the, the thing before that. You then have to look at your behavior, what you're doing, how you're doing it which is more important which is including what you're saying and how you're saying it most the vast majority of meaning in communication is not the actual words it's the voice tone and body language and things like that so hey I'm fine versus I'm fine you know or thank you you know thank you you know very different meanings between those things based on the body language and the tone so if you're getting, okay, I, I have, you know, say I'm in a, a traditional high school setting, I've got six classes a day, you know, and I got, most of my teachers are saying that, oh, I'm, I'm a butt, you know, I'm disruptive in classroom, I'm not getting work done, you know, I'm, I'm you know, having problems with peers, I have a problem with authority, you know, I have that, and you know the you know maybe I get I got in trouble with the cops or something one time too so there's a pattern emerging here and I can't sit there and say all the teachers are out to get me and the cops are out to get me I'm a holy innocent little angel being no I'm not it's my behavior that is creating the response from the outside world that I don't like so it's incumbent on me to change my behavior so my behavior is you know, disruptive and antagonistic and angry and mean. Well, why is it that? Well, uh, if you really get honestly to that, well, I feel kind of, you know, I'm angry about a lot of things and I don't like the way things are out. And if I'm going to be angry, if I feel angry and I feel sad and I feel this, then uh, damn it, other people are going to do that too. Okay, so now we're talking about our feelings and emotions. Now we have the feelings and emotions. So our feelings and emotions are driving our behavior. And our behavior is creating a response from the outside world. 
So if I want to change that outside response, I want to control what I see with that, then I have to change my behavior. The way I change my behavior is I start getting a knowledge and respect for and um, a handle on my emotions. I'm not saying emotions are bad. Everyone's going to be angry. Everyone's going to be sad. Everyone's going to have problems. Some people, you know, have had to deal with, with other traumas and, and problems and things that other people haven't had to. You know, I mean, I, I in, in the wider course of things, a lot of stuff in my life didn't turn out super badly. You know, there's a lot of things in, in my, you know, childhood and stuff that I didn't have to deal with that other people I know did have to deal with. And that's going to inform your emotions. All the things that are going to inform your emotions, like we talked about with this, it's going to be your physical brain. You know, the, the epigenetics, which we talked about before, is like your kind of environment and things like that. You know, things that have happened to you, the what you think of things, the way you think of things, the way you've been taught to think of things, so the conditioning that you've had from friends and family and, and that that socioeconomic status that you're in, that class or that available, all these things are going to start influencing that. And the way you start kind of, you know, can be able to get a handle on your feelings and knowing what's going on with that, then are your thoughts. So your thoughts are going to start influencing the thinking. So if, if now of a sudden you're going from zero to a hundred in your emotions, and you know, I'm, you know, I thought everything was cool, and then you know, Timmy just sort of kind of looked at me. That really pissed me off, and I threw it in. F him, man. He can't look at me like that. Um, which, as as a little parentheses here, unless you're a hermit and have no human contact, someone's always going to look at you, and someone's always going to look at you, and it might be ways that might be like, why are they making that face? But you don't know their thoughts. You don't know what's going on. They could be having a problem with something else, and they're just sort of looking around. There could be a hundred other things that are going on, and the one thing you think it is is not one of those hundred. You don't know. So someone's always going to look at you. Get used to it. But then your thoughts are like, he's looking at me like he's about to start something. F him. I'm going to finish this before it even starts. So you start getting angry. Your thoughts are some sort of threat or, or more likely uh, some sort of fake pride that is you imagine to be injured in that instance. I imagine to be injured this goofy stupid fake pride that I might have gets injured then I get angry. Anger always has a buddy so there's something else going on with the anger that you really need to get around to too and that might be in, in this case if I'm feeling that angry that quickly over someone's looking at me I might be insecure about a lot of things, so I hide my insecurities, I hide my own sort of like, oh man, I might get beat up with being angry, because I've learned that being angry and being very loud and aggressive, people kind of do this, and then I don't have to get into a situation where I might get beat up, because I really don't feel that, oh, I'm going to win a fight, or maybe I do win a fight, but I want to get hurt, or you know, all these other things might be going on, so people put on a lot of bluster and everything because they're afraid and it's really that fear that's driving the anger and that anger then is driving the behavior but then but people were not taught that especially guys in our society we're not taught it's basically anger and cockiness are kind of the only things you're really allowed to feel everything else is oh no you can't do that it's crap because you know unless there's something you know, almost sort of physically, again, back physically wrong or going on with the brain, and there's there's some sort of antisocial, sociopathic, psych, uh, psychopathic thing going on. You're going to have emotions. You're going to feel emotions. You need to learn about those. You need to learn how to feel them safely and healthfully in order to be able to behave in a way that's going to be helpful and easier and less problematic for you in, in the future. And then being able to understand what feelings you have and, and think about them and think about where they come from what they're doing to you internally as well as the response you're getting externally being able to think about that is going to help you be able to control that so you get you're you're able to be like guy looked at me man mm. wait a minute 
I'm not really threatened by this guy. He just sort of looked. Like he already looked. He just looked at me and looked away. So there's no problem here. Why am I getting pick, ticked off? I'm getting ticked off because, you know, before I left work, you know, I found out I had to do all this extra work. Oh, I'm angry really from that. So your thoughts are going to control that behavior. And that behavior is going to control... Is go, is so thoughts do control the behavior because they control and help manage your feelings. And the feelings are going to drive the behavior. The behavior drives the outside reaction and the outside reaction comes back into the thoughts because you're now getting that that sensory input from the outside world whether it be when you're driving or animals or other people or anything else you're getting that that sensory response from the outside world which now is going to go back into the idea of where's it again the idea of then where your thoughts are and what they're going to be so that will inform that so it if you want to control the outside world you got to manage your own thoughts you know if you have that cognitive dissonance you know and uh, having all those things knowing a little bit about the brain doesn't hurt uh, knowing you know when you're highly emotional your, your amygdala hijacks the more problem-solving thinking cortex part of the brain and therefore you're you're almost sort of physically inable incapable of thinking in higher dimension higher dimensions and thoughts you got to calm the hell down in order to be able to get that higher reasoning back knowing the environment that you grew up in you know knowing the patterns and behaviors that were sort of conditioned in you from your family and your friends and all that you know being able to stop and think and pay attention you can't just sort of not pay attention and just sort of basically stumble through life like some cartoon knocking into everything and knocking down and think everything's okay. You know, you're, you're, you're banging your knees on stuff, you're hitting your head on things, you're tripping, falling over in, in, in a sort of behavioral and, and life sort of way and blaming everyone else for it. You can't do that. You are responsible for that yourself. So now, now there are are there other things that happen outside of your control? Absolutely. The whole rest of the world happens outside of your control. The only thing you can really control is yourself. If, and if you want to deal, you want to get a different way with how people interact with you, then you're going to need to know how to control yourself and deal with your own thoughts and emotions and behaviors in order to rearrange that. Now, other people are always going to have their problems too. And they might be having a bad day you know, or bad life, or they've got really crappy conditioning with people of that too. Um, but how are you going to react to that is going to inform how then they're going to react too. So if you want to manage how they're reacting, even though they might not have as much control as you, you again have to work on you. So that's it for that one. Have fun with that.